Hello and happy Pi Day. I'm Eric Corman, Interim Co-CEO and Communications Director at League of Education Voters and the parent of a high school freshman of the global majority in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you wanna hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our Spanish interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial and disability injustice experienced by global majority communities is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides equitable opportunities for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity in every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series 10 years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar is the 2024 Legislative Session Recap, What Washington Students Got and Next Steps. To wrap up the 2024 Legislative Session, League of Education Voters Interim Co-CEO and Director of Policy and Research Jacob Vela, Government Relations Consultant Kerry Morris, and LEV Partners will provide an overview of what happened in Olympia, along with status updates on LEV's 2024 Legislative Platform, which is creating safe and inclusive learning environments, providing comprehensive supports for wellness and inclusion at school, supporting students receiving special education services, and establishing equitable funding structures. In today's webinar, we'll also answer your questions and let you know what we can do to prepare for the upcoming session in 2025. And now I would like to ask our panelists to introduce yourselves, starting with Ashley from the Washington LIAC, the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. And then feel free to popcorn in as you'd like. Hello, everyone. My name, oops, sorry. Is it going out? Okay, good. It's going out. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Treves. I'm a first year member currently on the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. I'm so honored to be here to panel for all of you and to speak on critical youth issues that are currently prevalent um, throughout the state. Um, I currently am, I go to Flamingo River High School and I'm a full-time full running start student at Clark College. Currently, I am just trying to experience and learn more about the legislature. And I did that through the PAGE program in the past month. That was such a phenomenal experience to be on the floor and get to know all my representatives, as well as working with Fuse Washington and STAND in the past session. They were such great organizations to pair up with. And something that brings me to my work every day is just knowing that what I'm doing is gonna really make a difference for among youth in the state. I know that what I'm doing and the role I have is so powerful and it can really make a difference just because I have so much uh, access to different organizations and I can testify way easier. I can make transportation to Olympia way easier. It's just all the things I have have made me into a really uh, important figure in my state and I'm really happy to be that for all of you. So thank you to all the legislators, faculty for coming today. Thank you. It's really Really great to have everyone hear me out as a representative for LIAC. <clears throat> Roxana, do you want to? Oh, Jordanas. Yeah, why don't you go next and then feel free to call on the next person. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jordanos Gabremla. She, her pronouns. I'm the deputy director in the Washington State Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds. And I'm going to do a brief visual description of me so that we all have access to the same information. Um, there might be some folks on the phone or otherwise can't see the screen. So I am a black female with thick curly hair that I'm currently wearing down 
with the middle part and tucked behind both ears. I'm wearing a medium pink shirt um, and purple rimmed, dark purple rimmed glasses. Behind me, you see a light gray wall. Above my head is a navy blue clock and you kind of see the beginnings of my white closet over my left uh, shoulder. Um, I am really happy to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, I have the unique experience of navigating K-12 education as a student with a disability who received special education services um, and a first-generation student in public as well. Thank you. And Roxana. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Roxana Gomez. I use she and her pronouns, and I lead the youth policy portfolio at the ACLU of Washington. Um, and to follow your Dono's need, uh, uh, lead, I'm a Latina young woman um, with uh, straight um, black hair. I'm wearing a dark navy blouse um, and appreciate you all being here. I'll pass it to, um, to uh, Sunshine again. Thanks, Roxana. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sunshine. I use she, they pronouns, uh, and I'm the public policy liaison at Disability Rights Washington. Um, and I am a mixed race woman with wearing a, it's like a light gray sweater um, and dark hair that is in a bun, like a messy bun that says it's finals week. Um, <laughs> and with that, I'll pass over to Ala Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Schaum. I'm the policy director at Washington STEM. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a white woman with dark brown hair, wearing a black t-shirt, and my background is blurred, but you can see a little bit of that sunshine. It's my pleasure to join you today, especially on Pi Day. Washington STEM is a statewide education nonprofit leveraging STEM for social change, removing barriers to credential attainment and creating pathways for long-term economic security for historically excluded students. In our state, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is at the forefront of discovery on the front lines of creative 21st century problem solving and serves as one of the largest pathways to household sustaining careers and long-term economic security. It's a joy to be here with you today and I'm going to pass it to uh, Stacy. Hi, everybody. I'm Stacey Dim. I'm the executive director at the ARC of Washington State. The ARC is an advocacy organization for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we are a megaphone for the voices of um, children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Um, before being at the ARC, I um, was at the governor's office of the education ombuds and then worked for a disability rights attorney named Bill Dusso, mostly working on special education issues. Um, I'm also a family member, and I'm hoping to bring that lens as we look at what happened in the legislative session this year. Thank you for having me. And uh, let's see, I will pass it over to Allison. Good afternoon. I'm Allison Pretzinger. I'm the Director of Public Affairs at the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, a large state agency that is focused on uh, the unique needs and the needs of children, youth, and families across Washington State, ranging from the early learning continuum, including preschool and child care, uh, through the prevention and uh, child welfare and juvenile justice and juvenile rehabilitation systems. Um, for visual representation, I am a white woman with straight blonde hair and wearing a dark green hoodie and a blurred background. And I will pass it to Jacob. Hello, I'm Jacob Vela, um, with, <clears throat> excuse me, with the League of Education Voters, uh, he can pronouns. Um, uh, I lead the policy and research over at LEV. Um, excited to talk to folks today. Um, and I am a, um, a male, uh, dark hair, uh, mixed race with a beard, um, have a green shirt and a blurred background of my room. So um, I'm looking forward to um, talking today. Thank you. I'll pass it to Carrie. Good afternoon, Carrie Morris. I'm the contract lobbyist for LEV, representing them down in Olympia. I am a boring middle-aged white woman <laughs> with glasses with a giant red heart behind me. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. To begin today's webinar, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the ancestral and unceded traditional lands of the 29 federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes in Washington state, including the Chehalis, Chinook, Colville, Cowlitz, Duwamish, Ho, 
Jamestown Sklalem, Kalispell, Lower Elwha Clallam, Lummy, Macaw, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Nooksack, Port Gamble Sklalem, Puyallup, Quileute, Quinault, Samish, Soxwiatl, Shoalwater Bay, Skokomish, Snoqualmie, Spokane, Squaxin Island, Stillaguamish, Suquamish, Swinomish, Tulalip, Upper Skagit, and Yakima. We give thanks to elders both past and present, our native and indigenous colleagues, and the land itself. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. If time permits, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome, Jamie, Jordanos, Carrie, Jacob, Roxana, Allison, Ashley, Stacy, and Sunshine. We'll start with Carrie giving a quick session recap, and then each partner will have about five minutes to present on your issues and what we can do to prepare for the 2025 session. Carrie will kick us off with a quick overview. And if any of you on the panel have any questions or feedback, feel free to jump in. After Carrie, we'll go to Roxana, and then to Allison, then Stacy, then to Jordanos, Ashley, Sunshine, and then Jamie. So Carrie, why don't you kick us off? Thanks, Eric. So yeah, we had a true supplemental year. A supplemental year means we were down in Olympia for just 60 days. And during that time, they passed three budgets, a supplemental operating, a capital and transportation. So it was busy. And on top of that, there was over 1600 bills introduced this year that we all spent the first couple of weeks of session reacting to with only about 380 or so that actually passed. So it kind of dwindled down the end, which was not unexpected. Um, the operating budget that mostly and the capital that we were looking at, they were true supplementals, which meant there was no big investments in new programs or anything. It was just looking at where they had to make adjustments to um, the allocations they put in last year. And they went with that and maybe increased it or even decreased if it wasn't meeting the expectations that they had in 2023. The biggest news, I think, and in, in respect of time, I'll be quick, is that there was kind of a mass exodus happening of, out of the legislature that we saw the last week or so. There are six confirmed legislators at, leaving the Senate right now with the surprise of ranking um, Ways and Means member Linda Wilson, I think was the only one it was really a surprise. But you also have about six members um, running for um, different higher offices. So you could see even more leaving by then. And about four, including in the House, including um, Representative and former Speaker Frank Chop just announced a few days ago. So we're expecting to maybe even see more and they will have to file to run by mid-May. So we'll be watching those to see what other changes might happen. So just, I will speak later on, but I just wanted to give you the overview of what we're working under. And sorry for those of us that were intimately involved the last 60 days, our brains are still unraveling a little bit and it's hard to focus. So just have a little bit of grace. <laughs> Carrie, you're doing great. Thank you. All right, uh, Roxana, uh, the floor is yours from ACLU Washington. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eric, for the invitation. And um, I just want to echo what, what Carrie said. It was a wild 60 days. And um, the issues that I'm going to talk about today, um, we were fighting basically up until the very last end. And that's uh, the issue of isolation and restraint um, use in public schools. And I've come before this um, platform uh, several times before to talk about um, isolation and restraint and its continued practice in the school, um, in public schools. But if this is your first time um, listening um, and, and you're surprised to know that we still isolate and restrain uh, students in, in public schools in Washington state. Um, currently, state law says that uh, they're supposed to be used, um, you know, it, for last resort. Uh, they're not supposed to be used for discipline. It's a very specific uh, standard um, uh, for for safety of the student um, or others. But what we found is the contrary. Is um, a lot of there's a lot of incidences in public schools, um, and the 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 disparities are 
pretty large. Um, for example, uh, students with disabilities account for about 15% of enrollment in our schools, yet um, account for 93% of, of um, the shares of isolation and 93% of the shares of, of restraint. So students with disabilities are heavily impacted by this practice, including um, Black students, uh, biracial students, students that are homeless, uh, students in foster care. Uh, it's hurting our most vulnerable students, and that's why we wanted to, uh, to change the practice in Washington schools. Um, thanks to the, the effort of uh, Representative Lisa Callen, our prime sponsor, we were able to get the bill through the House. Um, and, uh, um, and unfortunately, the bill died in the same spot as it did last session um, in uh, Senate Education Committee. Um, and, you know, I think as we come out of this session, we, we definitely have some lessons learned of um, just how Olympia works sometimes, right? And I, I think that's, there's always that balance of like, there's an immediacy and um, young people in our state are, are suffering. Um, and we want the radical change right now. Um, but I can assure you that everyone on this call knows that unfortunately it doesn't go that way. There's a lot of stakeholders that are involved. And we've been taking in that feedback um, from some other uh, other stakeholders. Um, you know, we recognize that change the way that we handle some of these situations in the classroom. We need investments in the classroom. And um, that's something that uh, we are engaged in, in conversation with, including Representative Lisa Callen and others, uh, so that we can find that middle ground. And I, I, I do just want to say that, um, you know, sometimes uh, money is presented as a barrier to not moving good policy, but money is also not the be all end all. We need like internal um, culture change um, so that we're not uh, relying on these practices anymore um, and moving away from that, um, from, from the crisis point. Um, but what we're talking about, they're preventative measures, like very upstream. And when you get to the crisis point, you are in that moment and you have to think fast. And so I, I, I sympathize. Um, um, but at the same time, like we, th this is our job, right? To fight, um, to make sure that students that are being harmed in the system don't get harmed in the system. So um, again, the bill did not pass this past legislative session, but we are already planning for 2025. Um, and as we plan this work, uh, in the supplemental budget, uh, there was millions of dollars that uh, were appropriated to OSPI, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, which is essentially our, our state education agency. Um, and they're gonna be getting money to um, implement uh, some professional development and technical assistance in classrooms, um, expand uh, this program that came out of the 2023 budget, which are essentially demonstration sites all over the state so that school districts that participate um, get that hands-on technical assistance to then phase out isolation and restraint um, in their schools. Um, so we'll be continuing continuing to monitor um, the development of that and make sure that um, it is done uh, with the utmost care um, for not only the professionals that are involved in the classroom, but also the students. Um, and so all of that ultimately helps our future legislative efforts in 2025. And as we come out of this session and we, you know, start to revitalize ourselves after that, uh, you know, 60 day session, I invite you all to think of um, how we can leverage our, uh, you know, personal stories and, and share with lawmakers. As Carrie mentioned, it's an election year. Um, and, you know, it's not a bad time to check in with your lawmakers to see uh, how they voted on this issue. Um, and something that I think a lot of people don't know as well is that the office of uh, uh, of super this the office of the superintendent of public instruction OSPI that is a mouth mouthful the superintendent that's an elected position and that elected position is also up for election this year. Um, so I'm just I'm just you know sharing knowledge out there. Um, do your political research um, because. Uh, 
we need movement on this bill and um and what a better way to start with the people that represent us so i will leave it there and um pass it over to uh to allison i think thanks so much roxana uh good afternoon again everyone i uh should also note I'm the mom of a second grader who doesn't have school for half of this week. So if you see an eight-year-old head pop in, apologize. We are in the mountains trying to decompress from the legislative session while balancing a no school schedule. So uh, thanks for your patience and grace as we navigate that. Um, for the purposes of, purposes of today's information sharing, I'm gonna focus on the early learning part of our continuum uh, in our education system across the state as that's where DCYF uh, plays a, some pivotal roles and, um, and where we'll focus today. Uh, by way of background for folks who may not know, DCYF administers uh, um, the state-funded preschool program through contract. We also manage the child care subsidy program. So that's for families who need financial assistance to support access to high quality early learning. Uh, we regulate uh, licensed child care providers, both centers and homes, support the professional development continuum, et cetera. So we have uh, quite a uh, extensive role in access to affordable, high quality early learning for children zero to 12, really, when you think about the after school care continuum uh, in our state. Um, you know, Carrie talked really about the true supplemental nature of this year. That was really true for early learning. The last couple of years, uh, in the pandemic, the early learning world really saw the windfall of massive one-time federal dollars that we were able to administer uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to licensed childcare providers really to keep that early learning uh, network open and, and sustained during the pandemic. Um, that was in large part thanks to quick action by our legislature uh, leveraging the federal dollars that, that came down as part of the pandemic relief. What we saw this year in the early learning space was really back to um, uh, uh, a more tightened approach. There was only a few pieces of legislation that passed that made minor modifications to eligibility for both um, preschool ECAP as well as child care, um, as well as uh, uh, one bill that was agency request legislation uh, that was largely a technical fix to the early support for infants and toddlers program, which is known as ESIT in Washington state. Uh, this is uh, early intervention for children zero, uh, one and two, who may have developmental delays or identified disabilities really to invest early in early intervention services through networks of community-based providers to support that child in their family unit and that development to, to help uh, uh, help accelerate their development and get them on, uh, on those and hitting those developmental milestones. So we had a bill that made a technical change to really support the practice realities for providers. Uh, so providers could begin their billing of this state on the first month they serve a child rather than having to wait for the second month. It was confusing, largely technical. At the end of the day, it passed. It'll be signed by the governor uh, in a couple of weeks, which we're really excited about. Um, so that was a, our big piece of legislation for the agency um, and probably the biggest piece of early learning legislation that we saw pass. We did see a few bills that modified expansion of who was eligible for subsidy, expanding that subsidy eligibility to ECAP teachers and providers. Last year, child care providers uh, received eligibility to Working Connections child care subsidy. And I think by uh, unintended action, unintentional action, the ECAP providers weren't sort of weren't sort of in there. Um, so that was that was adjusted this year. And then we saw a few investments, a couple I want to highlight. Um, we know that infant care, access to infant care that's affordable and quality is really, really challenging. And the legislature invested pretty robustly in the infant bonus, um, infant rate enhancement, moving that from $90 a month to $300 a month, really with the goal of creating more capacity for high, high quality infant care. Uh, and so families can see that. We know that learning starts at birth and infant care is super, super important. Those, those early months of brain development. Um, we also see continued investment in the early childhood mental health consultation system, infant, not, infant early childhood mental health consultation system. This is a, a robust program that helps support child care providers in navigating uh, children with complex needs in their care or complex dynamics in a classroom uh, and, and adds an additional layer of coaching and support rooted in infant early childhood mental health principles. We saw investment in continued professional development support uh, to bring new providers online and support providers in accessing their professional development requirements. Um, and we did see investment in the Early Learning Facilities Fund. That's actually run through the Department of Commerce, but DCYF is a, a partner in that. And we saw an additional investment really to buy down a number of eligible projects um, based on what was invested in last year's budget in this supplemental to continue to invest in expanding new capital capacity 
for uh, high quality early learning, both childcare and preschool. Um, so I think those are some of the early, early learning highlights in a nutshell. I will uh, take a moment to put a plug in for next year. Uh, it's a biennial session. DCYF has a lot of work underway, really learning and um, trying to shift our child care, uh, child care subsidy to uh, really reimburse and pay providers on the true cost of care. So moving away from a market rate system to a true cost of care while continuing to expand eligibility. The theory being that if more families are eligible for that subsidy and that subsidy rate is competitive and high enough to pay living wages of providers, we really will grow access to a quality early learning market, uh, which is, we know, critical when we think about research and outcomes for um, children needing quality and safe places when their families are at work or for families who choose to take that option. So um, be in touch with us. We'll be in touch with you this interim as we are building decision packages that will really make some of those next critical investments and take the next steps forward and really expanding access to quality early learning across the state. Thanks so much. And Eric, I'm sorry, I'm going to kick it back to you because I can't remember who goes after me. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. Allison, I know you've got to leave in a minute or so. Roxana, I know you have to leave as well. So both of you, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. I'll share the websites for DCYF and also the ACLU Washington in the follow-up email, which all of you will receive in about 24 hours. So if you have questions about House Bill 1479 on isolation and restraint or any of the early learning gains and strategies for 2025, feel free to go through the website to contact Allison or Roxana. So feel free to drop off when you need to leave. Um, I, I think it's fantastic that you are here. So next, uh, we'll go ahead and go to Stacey Dim with the Ark of Washington. And I know you've got to catch a plane. So after, Thank you. <laughs> after you go, um, yeah, feel free to drop off as well. I really appreciate you being here too, Stacey. And I, I appreciate, I was, I am constantly moving because I can't get Wi-Fi really great where I'm at. I'm trying to keep it as quiet as I can for everybody. So I didn't do my visual representation and I apologize for that. Um, I'm a Caucasian woman, middle-aged with blue glasses on, a cork board behind me um, and not a very glamorous background at that. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here. I'm gonna share my screen really fast because um, I just have a couple of things that all of us have actually started to talk about. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we had some of this um, queued up Shoot. Sorry, I'm, I don't have a mouse, and so I wasn't sure if I could make this happen. Let's see. Can you see that okay? Um, so uh, I just wanted to, again, say that this whole panel right here was instrumental in all of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, some of it I'm going to reiterate that other folks have already shared. Um, but the ARC of Washington State um, partners with the, the um, Washington State Developmental Disabilities Council, um, and a group called the Community Advocacy Coalition, which is about 50 organizations whose primary mission is to support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to live in the community. And we went into the session with uh, four goals around education, really, um, to eliminate harmful restraint practices in public schools, which Roxana did an amazing job covering, um, eliminating the, the funding cap on reimbursement to schools, um, so we've been ratcheting up that cap little by little so that um, uh, in many cases, these smaller rural school districts are um, not left using all of their local levy dollars to pay for the needs of students with disabilities when um, their enrollment goes higher than the state cap. Um, funding inclusive practices so that we can make sure that teachers and administrators have um, really clear vision and tools for how to include students with intellectual and developmental disabilities in public school settings um, in all classroom milieus, um, ensuring that they have the same strong relationships with other students without disabilities, and then shifting the burden of proof in a due process hearing um, was our a main goal, which I can say we, we prevailed on. I'm excited to talk about that in a minute. So some of the budget notables, I'm sure Yodonis will mention that the Office of Education Ombuds got two additional special ed Ombuds, well, there was about three and a half million dollars for special education teacher recruitment, which is very exciting. Uh, funding for professional development, which Roxana mentioned, um, that's very focused on um, the issue of restraint. Uh, in addition, it focuses on those schools that have uh, classrooms where students are included less than 80% of the day. As you can imagine, those are a lot of students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And those students are disproportionately affected by the issue of restraint and isolation, along with a few other groups, um, uh, including black boys um, um, 
and students who are from our tribal communities. Uh, the ECAP rate, uh, which Allison mentioned, was also increased, which is great, uh, the ESIT rate as well. There was about $5 million for an inclusionary practices project continuation that has pilot sites across the state um, that are giving teachers and administrators proper tools for how to include students with disabilities. Um, there was a also OSPI request to do a statewide IEP pilot. So that would ensure that all the school districts have access to one statewide IEP program, which should make it easier for families who are moving between districts, should make it easier um, for school districts in terms of their funding because there'll be a more centralized system. Not everybody's paying for IEP online. We're hopeful that that would have a positive benefit on that procedural aspect of providing special ed. There are a couple of audits and studies on how do districts spend their money, how well do they perform in um, spending that money, um, and then some standards work on non-public agency monitoring, which many of you may have seen articles in the newspaper about schools um, that are contracted by public schools to provide special education services. Um, a lot of those schools support students with very complex behavioral and language support needs, and um, it's important that we're keeping close eye on the results and the impact of um, those schools. In terms of bills, uh, we are very excited to say that we were able to finally pass a bill that shifts the burden of proof in an IEP, in an IDEA due process hearing uh, from primarily onto the parents so that the school districts have to prove their case. And because school districts have the legal obligation to comply with the law, it's really important that they are the ones that can demonstrate that in a due process hearing when a parent is challenging whether or not the program is appropriate and offering services to their child that help them to benefit from their education. Um, uh, the other thing that I will make sure and mention is there was a, a Senate joint motion by Senator Kaufman, sort of a symbolic measure to signal to the federal government that, hey, you've been underfunding your promise toward IDEA funding for a long time, and that does interfere with the state's ability to provide a robust education to students with disabilities. Um, and then the other one that I don't think anybody has mentioned yet is there was a change in the prototypical school model uh, that includes additional um, naming of specialists, including paraeducators, who should be part of every school and allows for funding for that to happen. Um, and so we were happy to see that. Uh, with that, I'll give a little shout out for next session. You know, we continue uh, along with my partners here to be very vocal about the use of restraint and isolation in our public schools and would like to have continued progress there, um, making sure the cap is eliminated so that it is not a barrier to students with disabilities being identified and served. Um, and then making sure that um, teachers and administrators have that vision and support for including our students with disabilities, especially those students um, who are right now in isolated and segregated settings for most of the day. So thank you very much. Great, and thank you, Stacey. I don't know why I'm passing it on to you. Sorry about yeah, that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Yordanos with the Office of the Education Ombuds. And and Yordanos, when when you start, would you mind just briefly telling us what OEO is and, and what OEO does? Yes. yes, I have a few uh, slides. I was actually thinking of skipping them in the interest of time, but I can I can share. Um, are my slides up? Yep, they are. They're in uh, in edit mode, and so once you hit uh, present, then they'll look really nice. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Um, so hi, yes, you're Donna Skabramlock from the Office of the Education on Buds, and I'll briefly share um, about what OEO is. Um, so OEO is a statewide agency here in Washington that created in 2006 by the legislator. Um, and we work with a little bit of everyone. Uh, we hear mostly from caregivers, but um, we have educators who may call medical professional, um, general public about questions or concerns about K-12 public education, um, sometimes involving a specific student. Um, and we work collaboratively and informally to address questions and concerns that come in so that every student can have their rightful access to education. Um, 
you can consider our work in sort of three main buckets, um, one of them being casework. So this can look like when folks reach out to our intake line and we provide quick information or guidance um, about public K-12 issues. Um, and I'll share a little bit about just a few examples that come into our office. Um, and for cases that fall within our strategic plan priorities, get assigned to a senior education ombuds for more extended support, longer than um, what one might receive at intake. That's one bucket, casework. Um, we also um, do workshops um, for folks who request information on different topics. So maybe discipline in Washington State, um, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, attendance and truancy. Special education is the one that I think we get most requests for. Um, so we'll do workshops and workshops can be requested from community-based organizations to other state agencies. Um, sometimes folks who work in our school communities or district communities will reach out and request a workshop. Um, and then the last bucket being policy work. And we do provide annual recommendations from what we see just on the ground day to day. You know, this is what's happening Policies and procedures on, you know, quote unquote, paper is one thing and how things are actually playing out on the ground and the impacts on students, on families, on educators can be something different. So it gives us an opportunity to share um, some recommendations from what we see in our day to day work. And then we also serve on different policy work groups and committees. And sometimes we are the ones intentionally seeking out those opportunities based on what's coming up. Um, other times these opportunities come through legislative mandates, but regardless of how that opportunity comes, it gives us an opportunity to work with our partners um, in, in the education field um, to share, again, some recommendations to improve education for all of our students. Um, on <clears throat> this slide is um, our a strategic plan flyer and some information about OEO's legislative uh, mission. Um, for the purposes of time, I will just read out our strategic plan priorities. I will say um, anyone with a question or concern can reach out <laughs> to OEO. <laughs> I know this sounds really, really good to your ears. I'm sorry. Um, anyone can reach out with a question or concern. Um, we have limited conflict uh, resolution resources. And so we reserve that for currently and historically marginalized communities um, and for those communities whose situation were really exacerbated with COVID-19. Um, so as part of our strategic plan uh, priorities, we're talking about students who are out of school, including students with disabilities on partial day. Um, and when we say partial day, we're talking about those instances where there's not a mutually agreed upon schedule where schools and families have come together, um, but a student being told or a caregiver of a student being told that they can attend school, say, two or three times uh, a week because that's that's uh, the supports that are available for that student. Um, people of color, Black, Indigenous communities, um, students who are experiencing homelessness, in kinship or foster care, um, students who are involved in the juvenile legal or juvenile rehabilitation system, um, immigrants, refugee, asylee, <laughs> migrant, or students or families whose primary language is other than English, um, and students receiving uh, WISE services, wraparound with intensive services, or CLIP, children long-term inpatient. So these, again, are our strategic plan categories, but anyone is welcome to call with a question or concern. Um, real briefly, there are multiple ways to get a hold of us from picking up the phone and calling to an email to completing an online intake. We do have access to interpretation. What we often tell folks is if the only thing that can be left on the voicemail is the name of the language, then we'll call back with an interpreter in that language. Um, and from there, we'll take some information. We have a short intake form that helps us triage uh, and share appropriate information. If one has already been completed, then of course we would just be reaching out and responding to what was shared uh, in the intake. 
um, if it is within the strategic plan, um, and someone is expressing, you know, there's been a complete breakdown in communication. Um, it's not just a quick answer to a question, then we may schedule with a senior education ombuds um, who will work on that case up to 120 days per student um, to just help resolve the issue. Um, we sometimes attend meetings. We do work statewide. So when we're attending meetings, um, it is virtual or a discipline re-engagement meeting, that sort of thing. And then just the understanding that resolution, resolution excuse me, might involve um, clarifying what options are, clarifying what the concerns are. Um, we are not an enforcement agency. We do work through informal conflict resolution. Um, which makes building that trust um, and the productive working relationships statewide really critical. Um, uh, the one other thing I'll say before kind of moving on here is I said, you know, one student uh, per school year for up to 120 days. I do want to say that uh, if we've worked with a family and um, say we've closed out the case and a few months down the line, the student is out of school for whatever reason, any reason at all, school refusal, discipline, you name it, um, unresolved bullying, whatever it may be, um, I would just say, please do give us a call and whether we're able to assign it for another full length case or um, provide just some additional support, um, that is exactly what we are going to do. So I say all that to say, um, please do reach back out if we have a situation where a student is out. Uh, these are just some common concerns that come in. Special education year after year after year comes in as the top concern. Even, uh, let's see, was it two years ago, I believe, a special education came did not come in, or it came in at number one, but the percentages were smaller um, and other issues took up more percentages of the calls that came in, but special education was still the first one. Um, discipline is another one, questions around HIB, um, harassment, condition, bullying. Enrollment and transportation, um, especially for students who are experiencing homelessness and, and in foster care, um, attendance, and then language access, the right to interpretation and translated materials for both students and caregivers. Um, what I want to talk about um, is in gross for substitute House Bill 1239, um, mainly today. Um, um, it was shared, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, head cold, I'm blanking. I'm blinking on her name. She just presented before me. <laughs> Stacy, Stacy uh, shared that the Office of the Education Ombuds uh, received some um, financial support for additional ombuds um, for their primary work to be special education related cases. Because again, we get cases involving so many different issue areas, um, but we. Um, did receive that support this session for some um, staff to to work on special education related cases. Um, back to the HB 1239, so establishing a single and uniform system for complaints related to um, and instituting a code of conduct, uh, ethics of, for conduct, excuse me, within or involving um, our elementary and secondary schools. So what this means for OEO is by July 1st and in partnership with OSPI, OEO to design a process for um, and also be the one that serves as a single point of access for receiving complaints um, about K-12 public education um, from folks who have firsthand knowledge of an issue that's happening. Um, and then referring to the most appropriate person who may be overseeing that uh, process or an entity for resolution at the lowest level possible. Um, also with OSPI developing a communication plan for sharing information um, with folks who reach out with complaints about steps in that process, um, when to expect to hear from either the person or the entity who's going to be overseeing that particular complaint process. Um, and then also having a unique identifier for each, excuse me, for each of the complaints that uh, come into our office. Um, 
OEO right now, we have information on our website about different complaint processes, um, you know, different policies, procedures, um, but we will also need to ensure that all, all complaint um, and investigate, investigative processes relevant to uh, public K-12 in Washington are listed on our website. So we'll need to um, just make sure that we have all existing options um, listed. And then for OSPI and each ESD um, to put information on their website that links to us um, as the access point for um, receiving complaints. So complaints, um, whether it's special education, um, whether it's um, a complaint on HIB, a complaint about um, certificated um, educators and, and other staff. Uh, and then the other part of this is for the Prof Professional Educator Standards Board and the Parent Educator Board, which was created, I believe, seven years ago, if I'm not mistaken, to engage with stakeholders in education, to take a look at the model of conduct of ethics uh, from the National Association of State Directors um, of Teacher and Education Certification um, to take a look at that and then report back to the legislator. And I don't have the date on here, but by September 1st um, of 2025, how a code of ethics would sort of strengthen, it would support an effective educator workforce. Um, if a model of ethics is going to be adopted or maybe revised uh, to to meet Washington's um, unique needs, or if there is going to be um, a code of ethics that's just created altogether for Washington. Um, and then to also share with the legislator any issues um, that PESB or the Paraeducator Board um, may see with adopting a code of ethics. Uh, and any recommendations for legislative action. The one thing that I'll mention, uh, something that came up during legislative session is the fact that there is already a code of conduct, professional conduct. Um, so just noting that this code of ethics would not be to replace or supplement the existing professional code of conduct that already exists. And that is it for me. Thank you. And I don't know who to toss to, so Eric, I'll toss it to you. Yeah, don't worry about it. Thank you so much, Adonis. Really appreciate all the information you shared and really appreciate the work that the OEO does. So uh, we're running a little bit short on time. So I just wanted to check in with Ashley and Sunshine and Jamie. Do any of you have a hard stop at 1.30? I do. I have class at one, I don't know, like 1.45. I have to go to Spanish. Yeah, no worries. But that's great because guess what? You're next. So <laughs> I'd love to hear what LIAC has been working on. And what oh, we can of do course. Thank you so much for everyone who has been sharing. You guys have seen, like, I feel like my uh my knowledge is not as in depth just because like, I don't like, like I'm a student as well. And it's like, but I'm also part of a really cool council, but um, I'm also not part of the legislative affairs committee, but I'm more part of like the public of like public affairs. So I'm just here to give you guys like what my understanding of the bill so far that we've come up with. And I was also there for lobby day and action day. So I'll get into that. Um, is there a way I can show my um my screen? Absolutely. You should be able to share your screen. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let's see where I can. Hopefully this shares it to the right. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Okay, I have prepared a very short slideshow, but it covers everything. So here is my Legislative Youth Advisory Council slideshow. Um, to first introduce myself, hi everyone, I'm Ashley. I introduced myself earlier, um, and I'm the girl with the brown hair, blue shirt, white coat in a very beautiful living room in my house. Um, and the Legislative Youth Advisory Council is a council uh, stationed in Olympia. And we meet there about two to three, four times every every um, year. So sorry if there's any background noise, it's my dog. Um, and so we meet there about three to four times a year in person. It can be really difficult sometimes because of um, because of transportation and school and scheduling. But um, hold on, hold on for a second. Sorry about that. Um, so 
the Legislative Advisory Council is a council of about um, 22 uh, young people from across Washington. We're very diverse and uh, like very diverse across like ethnic backgrounds, ages, um, where we live. So there's some people in rural areas, urban areas, and we've been trying this year to really get more people in the rural areas because of how easy it is to come from an urban area and have all these opportunities given to you. But when you live in a more rural area, it's a little bit harder to get the application to you and talk about how you've done so much when you live in such a small city, you know. Um, but yeah, we we work under the office of, uh, office of Lieutenant Governor Denny Heck, and we are here to address and advocate for current um, prevalent uh, youth issues across the state. Um, and I will get started with the legislative recap. So what happened in Olympia this 2024 session and what are some of our future visions? Let's see if this works. Okay, perfect. So if you can see, we had our annual action day events. This is such a fun event. It's so immersive. You really learn a lot. In fact, sometimes I wish I attended this event before I joined the council, but I guess I kind of went backwards with it. So we hosted this event and we received over 80 students of participation from several youth councils and commissions. And some of our, key new, our keynote speakers and panelists included Senator Claire Wilson, Lieutenant um, Governor Denny Hack, and our two live panelists, Ruslan and Stacy. And Ruslan is actually such a fantastic first year. He's uh, such a big guy on um, education, just like me and translation and uh, working on equity between like distributing uh, materials translated in everyone's language. Um, that's a big thing from LIAC and I'll get more into this, but this is such a great event. If you have any kids interested that live in Washington, I'm so happy to share the application with you since we are accepting applications for a new cohort. I will be a second year next year and I'm very, very happy to show you guys what we're up to. But this was this is definitely one of our biggest events during session that we host every year. And we attract commissions and councils and groups of people. And even if you want to bring a friend, they're welcome to because you basically get a free day of food, fun, um, music, you get to work with other people and network. It's just such a fantastic event. And this is one of the biggest things we do every year. Um, as for lobby day, this was way, this is a much more chill day. The legislative affairs uh, committee handles this more. We, I'm on the public affairs, so I handled action day pretty much uh, just as much as anyone else in the committee did. But the lobby day is about lobbying. And I really learned what lobby was this year through the council it was really hands on. I never really got that like sit down before you learn all the terms. That's why I went to page school in February. Um, so for our one pagers, these are just kind of what we focused on. So we focused on education equity, mental health equity. We're learning about we really care about education and we had this inclusive uh, Senate bill actually in the last session, which was really close to making it out, but it did not. A lot of the members did testify on it. Um, I was not part of the council at this time, but I do know that there was progress and I don't think we really focused on that bill this session, but the ones that we did lobby on was, I wanna make it as concise as I can so I can leave room for the other panelists, but um, House Bill 1915, which focused on financial education. I actually attended a Office of Superintendent uh, Public Instruction meeting at the, at the, like, at the office, the official office, and a lot of the students there were actually quite against this bill, and I was very lucky to attend this meeting and get insight because a lot of the kids felt like it's limited their freedom about choosing their courses. They felt that it was an unnecessary thing, but a lot of other people think it's necessary. So it's like a really controversial, but also nonpartisan bill, which I found really interesting and I was very curious about it. Um, I think there's many kids that are still interested in it, but the council kind of took that advice from those kids that were like, no, like it's another requirement. Like we already have so much to do, you know? So that's something we took into consideration. And then I am pretty sure I lobbied in, I lobbied on House Bill 2023, translating voting materials and to different languages. Um, if, if I click on this link, I access all the one pages. So this is what our council is. We kind of introduce ourselves to the legislators that we are going to for help. 
And then these are just uh, very short to longer um, one pagers that we used. So there's quite a bit. We chose what we wanted to. Each member was able to choose the, the one they wanted to advocate on. This was mostly kids on the legislative affairs, but obviously as a public affairs, I just came as support and I read through them and I had a lot of fun with it. So as for the next thing, focus is the priorities or priorities for the next year. These include, uh, these are the ones we have so far. We haven't had a meeting since, we've kind of had a leisure time since action day, which is in January. So these are just things that I'm taking from organizations I've worked with and current policies that I checked in with my group in with last night, especially the first year, since we're going to be the ones on the council still next year, not the second year. So we're going to be like the bigger leaders, the people who lead the next cohort, the next generation of LIAC. Um, so stand ninth grade success initiative. I did testify on this bill as an individual, not with LIAC. This is just something that I'm very passionate about. And I was very happy to do this. It's such a great experience. And uh, we just found out that the Senate and House has put in $3 million for this policy. It's a very big accomplishment. Let me tell you, I'm really happy that my testimony might have even helped a little bit. And then as far as I know, Stan does want to keep growing this um, initiative. I know I'm not quite sure if it's like completely embedded. All I know is that the budget was including this initiative. And then for dual enrollment and CTE credits contributing to college credits, we want to ensure that we have, that all the work that students are doing is helpful to their, to their future and that it prevents any financial burdens on them if they don't need it. And then the inclusive education bill, House Bill uh, 5462, that is one that we were working on and I'm not quite as familiar with this one, but I do know the second years did work on this last year. And I think we're gonna continue looking into this bill. Sometimes these bills take like two to three years to really get to because we have so many bills we wanna get to. And then as for the translation materials for public schools and voting, that was House Bill 2023. I lobbied on this bill. Um, and we were, we as a council, like the first year we all agree that transition materials are really important and critical for students to uh, fulfill their full potential in education. And then we also have kind of a mixture of the three. So education, equity, mental health. We really care about those three. Those are really big in our council so far. I'm really looking forward to what um, goals and priorities the next cohort may have that I haven't even thought of because I may not be part of that part of I've, I may not be from that part of Washington. And then we're gonna continue to review the one pagers we use to lobby on LIAC. So the ones that I just showed you guys, we're gonna be using those and we're gonna continue to just kind of build off of those. And a lot of those focused on education, materials, equity, mental health, um, what we include in our curriculum, just that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and yeah, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. It's a really brief and concise, but I want to keep it that way because I don't want to say anything that the council may not be in agreement with since we haven't met in about a month. So it's making it the best I can. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries, Ashley. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, some good news, though, is that Senate Bill 5462, the inclusive education bill, uh, that did pass. It so did? It did. I'm so happy. I did not know that. Thank you so much for letting me know. I was just doing some research just like about an hour ago on all the bills and I didn't put that one in, but I'm really happy to hear that it did pass and that it will be such an influential thing in our education here in Washington. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, I know we're, we're over time. So thank everyone for, <laughs> for sticking around. I really appreciate this. Carrie, I know you've got to go and you were going to uh, talk about the initiatives, but we'll have to do, in fact, that we will do another webinar on the initiatives and we'll have time to dig into that a little bit more. So Carrie, thank you for being here. Really appreciate all the work that you do. All right. So next we've got Sunshine and then Jamie. Uh, Sunshine, the floor is yours. And Ashley, if you could stop your screen share, then uh, that'll open us up again. Thanks. 
Thanks, Eric. This is Sunshine. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to do the like the too long didn't read version. Um, thank you so much for inviting me back this time last year. I think I was actually in a webinar with other advocates to talk about Nothing About Us Without Us, which um, at the time had gotten really close to the finish line, but had stalled. Um, this year, I'm so excited to come back and say that the bill has passed. It is now sitting on the governor's desk awaiting his signature. Um, and the bill passed with really overwhelming support from um, the legislature as well as the communities. And I also, I wanna give a big shout out and thank you to both Lev and the Governor's Committee on Disability Issues and Employment for your amazing partnership with DRW in this work. Um, so I guess I'll, I'm gonna skip over um, talking about the history of the bill, but if folks have questions, I'm always happy to chat. Uh, but the the sum of it is that assuming that the bill is signed starting in 2025, any temporary statutory entity that's created uh, by the legislature to address issues directly impacting um, folks from underrepresented populations, so this is task forces, work groups, things like that, must include at least three members um, with direct lived experience to the issue that that group is seeking to address. Uh, and to the greatest extent possible, that membership must reflect the diversity uh, of, of Washingtonians' experiences. Um, I think the most important thing now um, is around implementation. And so I've been thinking a lot about uh, knowledge as a form of access to power. And I think it's really, really important that um, we continue to stay embedded in community and involve uh, and, and make sure everybody knows about, um, about this bill. Starting in July, the Office of Equity will uh, be doing some stakeholder engagement to create a, a toolkit to help uh, entities implement this bill with fidelity. Um, and so I'm uh, interested in doing some outreach and making sure that um, as many folks are at that table as possible. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because I know that we're over. But again, if folks have questions, I'm always happy to talk offline. Great. Thank you so much, Sunshine. And I'll be sharing the website for Disability Rights Washington in the follow-up email. So anyone is welcome to follow up and nothing about us without us is, is a great bill. So I'm just happy that it was able to make it over the finish line. And Sunshine, thank you for all of your work on it. So Jamie, um, thank you for your patience. Really appreciate it. Uh, feel free to talk about any of the bills in higher education that you would like to. The floor is yours. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Eric and everyone. And thanks for the folks that are still hanging around. Um, for Washington STEM, we do our work in three key areas. And so we do work in early learning, in K-12, and in career pathways. For the purposes of today, and uh, because of what has already been shared by partners across the state, particularly in the early learning space, I'll focus on a couple key things in the K-12 and career pathway space. Um, Washington STEM has a uh, wonderful advocacy website and a very extensive bill tracker so you can kind of see all the things that we tracked and supported and uh, chimed in on for this past legislative session. In our policy and advocacy work, we really work to champion transformative solutions through educating decision makers, through storytelling and collaboration to create that lasting foundation for equitable change in Washington. One of the things that I'm really excited to share with you that passed this year in the K-12 space is actually a result of a supplemental session, as Carrie mentioned. And so part of a supplemental year is we see bills that were introduced maybe last session come back into um, this current session or the one that just ended. And one that we were really excited to see pass is um, House Bill 1146, which notifies high school students and their families about available dual credit programs and any financial assistance. We and the research of our partners indicate that 90% of high schoolers in Washington aspire to pursue some sort of post-secondary education, which is education beyond high school in the form of a two or four year degree apprenticeship certificate opportunity. But we know that only about 40% of students, high school grads and non-grads are on track to obtain that post-secondary credential. So 
when we think about dual credit, um, this is one of the levers that we can pull to help bridge that gap between K-12 and a student's post-secondary pursuits. And we know that students largely rely on teaching staff and peers, and that they want information early and often about the opportunities ahead. We also know that last year saw a great success in the passage of eliminating college and the high school fees. And so by having a simple policy bill, House Bill 1146, which creates that um, conduit between parents and families for school districts to share all the available information about dual credit, we're putting that information in the hands of students and families to be able to make well-informed and well-defined choices. And that will lead me into a little bit about 2025 um, here at the end. The other one that I want to mention is Senate Bill 5904. So this is kind of getting into the higher education space. And this bill extends the eligibility for state financial aid programs from five to six years, which brings them into alignment with the federal Pell Grant Program. This piece of legislation was requested by the Washington Student Achievement Council, which is our higher education agency in our state. And the bill not only aligns the Washington College Grant, but also college, the College Bound Scholarship and the Passport to Colleges programs. For those of you not familiar, College Bound is a program for students in seventh, eighth, or ninth grade who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch to provide financial aid awards to students once graduating. It's often referred to as an early commitment of available state aid. And then the Passport to College program um, and the Passport to Apprenticeship program is a program that primarily serves former foster and or homeless youth in our state. And I'm excited to note that not only does this bill extend eligibility from five to six years, but also removes um, the maximum age requirement for the Passport to College program, which was previously at 26. There's still a minimum age for enrollment, but it removed that barrier for the maximum age of enrollment, which is great. What we know is that aligning state and federal financial aid programs provides critical support to students of color, as well as students who are low income, first generation and or supporting students. And we at Washington STEM have a hunch that it is the students who are opting into high demand technical and STEM degrees who are maybe most likely in need of more time to complete. We also have a hunch um, and WASAC uh, has estimated that about 6,800 students who are currently receiving one of these three financial aid programs are within one year of losing their access to state financial aid, but all are currently on track to graduate. So the bill does include some data collection to help us confirm um, how many students may need just that one extra course or that one extra quarter um, as they're opting into this program. And then the last thing, um, when we kind of look forward into 2025 at Washington STEM, we do our work in early learning, K-12 and career pathways. So you'll see our policy priorities centered in those key areas. One that was already previously mentioned by our colleague, Allison Krutzinger, is that we're working in the data space to align cross-agency data in early learning um, to really take a, a look at finding solutions for that true cost of care. So we're working closely with early learning partners across the state. In K-12, we've been highly focused on this teaching workforce, particularly the STEM teaching workforce, and we just released a blog about that on our website. And so we're looking at those policy levers that we can pull to support that teaching workforce, as well as how we continue to support that transition from K-12 into post-secondary, and also that early learning to K-12 transition as well. I'll also say that, um, and Ashley brought this up, in dual credit, we've made lots of strides in the different forms of dual credit and removing barriers. And we're continuing to focus on CTE dual credit, career and technical education dual credit, which is one of the most accessible forms of dual credit. However, we're not seeing folks, um, the availability for folks to apply those credits in their post-secondary pursuits, which is a really a system level um, conversation. So we're going to collect policy ideas, continue to collect them, research and listen deeply to partners, including folks on this call. We 
um, assess these policy opportunities with our legislative evaluation framework, and we rely on experts, both internal and external. And so we're looking forward to connecting with you all over the interim as we distill down into policy priorities for the next biennium. Thank you so much for having me. Great. And, and thank you so much for being here, Jamie. Really appreciate it. We'll be sharing Washington STEM's website in the follow-up email, and we'll also be widely sharing this recording. So uh, folks will be able to hear what you've been working on and, and how they can lean in for the 2025 session. Also, Jamie, if you and, and Sunshine, if you need to leave because we are over time, we certainly understand if you do. So uh, not a worry. Again, uh, the recording will be available widely and uh, folks will be able to, uh, to share this around. So that brings us to Jacob. And uh, Jacob, um, why don't you uh, let us know uh, what League of Education Voters has been working on and uh, any <laughs> steps for 2025? Yes, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, and thanks everyone for stick sticking with us um, so far. Uh, um, there's a lot to talk about, um, but uh, a lot has already been shared. Um, a lot of the stuff that we've been working on the last several months um, has been shared. Um, from the isolation restraint work to um, inclusive practices. So I'm gonna focus on some stuff that um, hasn't really come up as much today, um, which is gonna be mostly around education funding issues. So um, as folks are well aware, districts are in the midst of some very difficult financial challenges um, as some of the federal um, relief, COVID relief dollars are starting to get kind of dry up after the school year. Um, so there were has been a couple of proposals this session to um, make some tweaks to funding formulas to add more money to the system to kind of ease some of the strain on districts. Um, and those came in the form of two different bills that ended up passing the session. One is 2494, which increases uh, what, what's referred to as MSOC, it's material supplies and operating costs. Essentially, it's what you need to make a, a school building function um, from um, repairing the HVAC system to paying the utility bills to buying pencils and, and uh, notebooks for, for students. Um, so that uh, was increased um, uh, around $40 million. Uh, this biennium will go be going towards um, statewide for districts to um, better address those costs. Um, generally, districts tend, tend to spend a lot more than they're funded for by the state on those areas. Um, and those funding, that funding increase will start this current school year. So it'll kind of be back built to the start of this current school year. Another area is around, um, um, was an SB 5882. And this made, um, there were a lot of discussions around paraeducator um, staffing and funding going into the session. Um, the one that ended up passing the session was around increasing allocations and state funding formulas to enable districts to hire more paraeducators or be provided more funding to, um, hire more paired educators. Um, so that'll um, uh, increase funding level. So all districts um, will um, be uh, receive the same kind of person funding increases from a staffing perspective. Some districts with higher uh, property values will get more money than other districts with lower property values, um, but uh, it'll impact all districts. One of the other areas um, is gonna be around its um, through HB 2180, which Stacey Dim mentioned earlier, um, but it was around the special education funded enrollment cap, which caps um, the amount of funding a uh, district can get from serving students to only receive funding for up to 15% of their students um, receiving special education services. Um, that, that cap was increased from 15% to 16%, which is going to um, allocate about $20 million more in funding for districts um, for and that's going to start um, this upcoming school year. Um, one other area I wanted to mention is there was um, some funding provided um, uh, to provide the equivalent of leverage enrichment support um, or local effort assistance support for um, uh, public charter schools across the state who aren't able to access uh, local levy dollars. This allows them to um, access the equivalent of those funds um, uh, at least in in, in part, um, up to 50, about $1,500 per student, um, which is still less than uh, most districts are able to um, generate the local levy system. Um, and just kind of taking a step back, as folks have mentioned, the session has been challenging in a lot of ways. It was truly a supplemental year where not a lot of new funding um, went out to different programs. Um, additional reason um, beyond what's been mentioned already that for that is 
a couple important uh, areas of K-12 um, education funding around transportation costs and um, school meals costs um, ended up being a lot more um, expensive than expected initially. So that um, ate into over $100 million of, of funding that maybe could have gone to other K-12 programs, um, just had to kind of go to backfill higher than expected costs over the um, over this biennium. Um, so no policy increases, but um, so it made it a lot tighter of a policy environment than folks had hoped. Um, so that's um, in part why um, some of the overall education funding increases weren't as much as folks were hoping. Um, uh, that was one of the contributing factors. So um, we'll I will put it in the chat, but we have a site, uh, budget summary, summary that kind of highlights some of the budget provisos and budget and bills that have been funded this, this session. Um, but that's about it. Thank you um, for the time. Great. Thank you so much, Jacob. And I'll go ahead and share that budget summary in the follow-up email as well. We have two quick questions that, uh, that we can get to before we wrap up here. The first one is, what will the next step be to change the 60% of votes needed to pass a school bond to either 55% or 50%? Has there been discussion around putting the question to the voters? Yeah, thank you for bringing up that question. It's a very important question. Um, and just for a quick context for folks, um, school bonds need a super majority of 60% to pass. Um, which is different from uh, uh, levy um, levy um, issues at the ballot, which just need a uh, fifty percent plus one. Um, and many districts in recent years have had a very significant challenge in passing um, school bonds to be able to um, build or meaningfully renovate um, existing buildings or other infrastructure. Um, and it just has become an impossibility for many districts to to actually pass a bond and actually get funding to um, make sure schools can um, kids can learn in safe learning environments um it's an issue that's gained more traction and attention in recent years but this um but districts are, are still having a, a, a meaningful challenge in, in passing bonds this in this recent um election cycle a few did pass um back in february but it's still a very challenging environment um there's a number of issues uh that will um a number of factors that will influence it um, bringing um, the, the school bond issue to a simple majority could be could be brought to the voters. Um, it is part of the state constitution, so there there's a higher level of threshold. No matter what happens, it also does have to go to the people. Um, I there's not an active um, there there won't be one this session uh, this election cycle in November, but um, as it becomes more and more of a challenge for more and more people, um, uh, that that is more and more of an option going forward. Great. Thank you, Jacob. And we just have one last question, which is, I'm frustrated as a teacher and as a citizen. Year after year, schools are getting less money. Next year, the middle school at which I work as a special education teacher will receive $85,000 less in funding. And we already have more than 32 students in most classes. What can individuals do to get our state legislature to fully fund education in our schools? That is the million dollar question right there. Um, uh, the, what you are sharing and what you're experiencing is um, we have are hearing it from teachers and district staff um, and, and families across the state right now. Um, the, the resources are, are really tight. The cost of providing everything from, from buying books to curriculum to putting gas in the school buses to pick up kids is going up and up. Um, and it is um, really constricting school district budgets and making um, more and more difficult choices that districts have to make um, with the limited funds that they do get. Um, the, um, we are underfunding our, our K-12 system, especially around special education. Um, this is an issue that Lev has been working on and will continue to work on um, uh, strongly in the years to come. Um, when we will be sharing, uh, we'll be coming up, up with um, some some reports that this summer that, that highlight some of the challenges and ho hopefully can um, uh, show a, a path forward for that, that process of um, making sure we have funding formulas that are reflective of needs and actually meet student needs as well. Great. 
Great. Well, thank you, Jacob. And thank you, Ashley and Roxana, Jordanos, Allison, Stacy, Sunshine, Jamie, and Carrie. And thanks to all of you for participating and for submitting questions. I'll share the websites of the panelist organizations in the follow-up email, as well as the budget summary that the Love Policy team created. And you should receive that email in about 24 hours. Our next webinar will take place on Thursday, March 28th and will be about how our institutions are accommodating and navigating the delay in higher education financial aid for 2024. In this free webinar, Washington State institutions will share the steps that they're taking to help students cope with the financial aid delays and how students and families can navigate the current situation. The registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just go to events and then lunchtime webinars, and I'll also send that registration link in the follow-up email. Spanish interpretation and closed captioning in English will be available. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, please visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true economic and educational equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Jacob, Ashley, Roxana, Jordanos, Allison, Stacy, Sunshine, Jamie, and Carrie, thank you again for joining us, and thank you for all you do for Washington students and families. You have a great rest of your week.